Thank you for the invitation. <laughs> it's um, an interesting time, um, not only the selection of this particular day, uh, which seemed to be in a long way coming, and I suppose most of us would regard as a very sad day, um, a day that we could have avoided. Um, and it's also obviously the, the teeth of an election campaign. And I'm, I've achieved actually this minute something that I've been trying to achieve for the last three weeks, and that's by location, because I'm doing an interview on Sean O'Rourke right now. Um, <laughs> which um, is no mean, no mean achievement. But thank you for um, the invitation to be with you, and I want to just share a few thoughts with you from uh, a Labour Party perspective um, on where we go from now, where we go from here, and what are the, the, the choices that our country will face. For a century, there's been a two-way movement of people between Ireland and Britain. There are many familial and economic ties between these two islands. That led to the common travel area being established uh, after Irish independence, which facilitated the free movement of peoples between these islands to continue, and also ensured that Ireland and Britain largely share a unified labor market. We had free movement of people long before the creation of the European uh, single market. I'm glad that both the Irish and British governments signed a new memorandum of understanding in May of last year to preserve the common travel area post-Brexit, including the rights of Irish and British citizens in each of our jurisdictions. Um, most people felt, well, that was extant anyway and wasn't under threat. But there was a concern in the fractiousness of uh, a disorderly uh, exit that, that might have been under uh, threat, and it was uh, a very important um, achievement to actually codify for the first time what was a bilateral agreement. Ireland's economic model remains closely aligned to that of the United Kingdom. Access to the British labour market has been a safety valve for Irish unemployment for decades, obviously searingly so, in the early decades of our state. And the tradition of taking the boat has perhaps given birth to the culture where Irish people today take the plane to Australia or America to work and to gain life experience. For many years, workers were tempted to the British side of the pond, the British side of our shared labor market by the lure of higher wages or greater work experience. Only more recently has this trend reversed in favor of migrant workers coming to Ireland for jobs at high levels of our economy. Not only wages, but also income tax and VAT have tended to be reasonably closely aligned between the United Kingdom and Ireland. Cross-border trade is part of that equation. But also, levels of personal taxation in Britain tended over the decades to be the benchmark used to determine whether Ireland's tax system is competitive. I believe that has been very unhelpful. Not least, it leads to facile comparisons between headline tax rates, ignoring effective tax rates, that people actually pay, and ignoring the many different tax credits and tax breaks that are different in each of our systems. This is just one example of many, showing how Irish public policy has been hugely influenced by the public policy dominant in the United Kingdom. And now, the UK is leaving. Ireland is remaining within the European Union. In addition to all the economic risks for Ireland, there is also an opportunity now to imagine a new direction for Ireland that is less focused on our close historical relationship with Britain. Ireland now has two distinct goals. Firstly, we want to retain a close relationship with the United Kingdom, of course we do. And to facilitate this, we want the UK to have a close relationship with the markets 
and structures of the European Union. And secondly, we want Ireland to remain close to Europe. And we want to seize the opportunity now available to develop our country in the way that other small, open, trading countries within the European Union have done, countries like Denmark and Finland, to name but two. They enjoy a higher level of quality of life, of social well-being, and they've built economic models and public services that have provided a large level of equality. It may not be possible to achieve both of these goals. And a serious question, therefore, arises for Ireland, even in this election. And that is, in which of these goals is more important for Ireland and her people right now? From a Labour Party perspective, we will work to achieve both. We will continue to insist on an open Irish border in any event, as we have done from the start of the disentanglement process. We will work with our friends in the UK Labour Party and in the UK Labour Movement, people that we're in constant contact with uh, in the TUC, like their General Secretary Francis O'Grady, to push for a close UK-EU partnership with no barriers to trade. But the prospects of a close partnership between the UK and the EU are currently very uncertain. Boris Johnson has made, his, made it clear that his government doesn't want to be closely aligned to the European standards, including protections for workers and the environment. So if push comes to shove, Labour's preference will lie with a closer relationship with the European Union over one with Britain. It is not at all clear if this view is shared with Fianna Fáil and Fine Gael. The manifesto tax plans that are now being put before the Irish people of Fine Gael, of Fine Gael would, put public spend, would cut public spending by 8.6 billion euros over the next five years. And their income tax plans in particular would change income inequality, worsen it in Ireland, and make it more distant from the emerging patterns within the European Union. We, if those particular plans were implemented, would actually be among the most unequal distribution of tax and, and, and wealth uh, in the European Union, moving Ireland much closer to the British model. It would re represent a significant change, which would undermine, in my judgment, the tax and welfare system that has taken many years to develop and worsen, as I say, the inequality between high and low income earners in our market. The OECD uh, and the ESRI have repeatedly shown that baseline income is grossly unequal in Ireland. What brings us to the European norms is the state intervention through taxation and social welfare. And if, that, if those two mechanisms, the actions of the state, move closer to Britain, then that inequality will worsen. It would bring Ireland, however, closer in line with the UK in terms of inequality. It would also lower government spending in Ireland to well below what is typical in North European or West European countries. If you look at Fianna Fáil's plan to cut public spending by 5.6 billion in terms of available tax revenue. It's less severe, but the direction of travel is still, is still the same. They too will drag us towards a lower tax, smaller government model favored by British conservatives. And their cuts to capital gains tax will obviously worsen income and wealth inequality. So both Fianna Fáil and Fine Gael have repeatedly compared Ireland's income tax rates to the United Kingdom's rather than comparing our public services to those provided in the Denmarks and the Finlands of Europe. That says a lot about their contemplation of the direction of travel of our country. So we may have arrived at a point at which the cross-party support for government policy on Brexit will end. 
Labour will not support any government that seeks to distance Ireland from, e from European norms to remain closer to British economic policy. This election marks the point where cross-party unity over Brexit policy has been contaminated by party political difference. Fine Gael have mixed up the state's European policy with their own election politics. They've used meetings with European officials as part of the election campaign. Ireland's EU commissioner, nominally non-partisan, has made clearly political interventions to favour the government party by talking up the threat of Brexit at this critical time. As a matter of fact, the threat of a hard Brexit shows the weakness of what Fine Gael ultimately achieved. Far from ensuring a bulletproof cast iron settlement of Ireland's real and genuine concerns, we now have, have a vulnerability to a capricious and mendacious Boris Johnson's politics, who has legislated to rule out any extension of talks beyond the end of this year, and who is hostile to any level playing field of rights and standards between his country and the European Union. At best, we are likely to seek a minimal trade deal in goods, which will do serious harm to the economy. We may even see the UK engaging in attempts to undermine its neighbours by lowering its work standards or environmental standards. And a hard Brexit, therefore, is still a real prospect at the end of this year. This is a challenging vista. But there is no reason to believe that Fine Gael would be any more successful than any other political party who understand these challenges in pursuing and protecting Ireland's interests. Any future government would have our exemplary diplomatic corps and public service to assist them, to support from across Europe, for Ireland, uh, across all shades of political opinion, from all our social democratic, liberal and conservative parties, they will remain robustly uh, loyal to our position, regardless of who enters government here. So Labour's vision is clear. We want Ireland to become more like the other small, open trading economies of Europe, we want a decisive shift in public policy away from the tax giveaways of the Anglo-Saxon politics of the United Kingdom pursued by Boris Johnson and Trump's USA and towards the solidarity and collective investment in public services that has been long the hallmark of North European social democracy. Labour wants to see the development of collective bargaining rights for all workers and a restoration of national dialogue on major economic policies, including on climate change and on investment in infrastructure. We want higher in-work training and education, higher productivity and higher wages. We want to achieve free of charge health care and education, good quality public transport and well-planned communities and affordable public housing. We want strong ambition on climate and a vision for a clean, green economy. All of this, we believe, is possible alongside innovation and entrepreneurialism. Following the example of other countries, we can go a long way towards eliminating long-term homelessness and child poverty in this country. And the route to a, Euro a more European Ireland in the aftermath of Brexit is, would be blocked by any reckless undermining of our tax system. So, we are truly at a crossroads. Britain, under Boris Johnson, has set its course to be a Trump-like, deregulated, socially unjust society. Europe, without Britain, will evolve, I believe, in a much more social democratic fashion, with strong public services. So we have a choice of what we want for Ireland's future. Our vision is crystal clear. We will wholeheartedly embrace the inclusive and socially just North European model. We want a well-regulated economy that provides access to essential services and real opportunities for all. Ireland's perennial dilemma of keeping a leg in both the British economy and in the continental European economy is no longer sustainable. 
This election will set Ireland's direction of travel. The choice of closer to, to Brexit Britain or closer, closer to evolving Europe is not only important, it will have very long-standing consequences. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, but in the meantime, we'd like to take questions from the floor, um, Germain, to the, the subject matter of international European affairs and the subject matter that Brendan addressed there. So um, I'm going to take questions and we'll do them one by one, unless we get too many, we, we, then we'll we group them. But otherwise, we'll start, please, on the right. Thank you very much, Francis Jacobs. Um, thank you very much for a very interesting uh, speech. And I'm, I really noted your uh, support for the, the Nordic model, Denmark, Finland, and so on. Um, one of the big choices, though, that the European Union is now facing is, of course, on its longer-term budget. Mm. And there's been this shibboleth of the 1% uh, budget, and yet, if you want to do so many things of solidarity and strength in the European Union, you, you need a bigger budget. And yet, the Nordic countries you, you admire are among the big supporters of just sticking to the existing budget. Yesterday at the similar meeting, Mjol Martin, without saying how much, said that he supported a larger European Union budget. Where do you stand on that? It's a very fair question. And um, I have to tell you, I have very first-hand knowledge of those very views, because I attend uh, the PES leaders' groupings um, with, with prime ministers and leaders uh, from countries like Denmark and Sweden um, that you would imagine would be uh, pushing for a broadening of uh, social solidarity in that sense. Um, and in truth, there is a, uh, they, they are responding to pressures from their own in, in, internal constituencies, uh, and there is a, a reluctance to push for a, a, a greater European budget. I think there is a need for one. I think Europe... If it's, it needs, at its heart, to be able to fund its, its, its social direction, uh, and I would be in favour of that, and I've argued that within the confines of, um, uh, of our socialist leaders group. Um, I was involved in the last multi-annual financial framework negotiations, and um, there's always a, a reluctance to even acknowledge that you're pushing for more money for Europe, uh, because we've allowed it to be cont contaminated uh, and that's particularly true, obviously no longer will be true, with Britain. For example, uh, I insisted on continuing the Peace 4 funding and money for Interreg. Uh, and I had discussions with the Cabinet Office in Britain during the last uh, multi-annual financial framework discussions. Uh, and I, fi I finally got to a position is, uh, because obviously I wanted a joint presentation from Ireland and Britain uh, to the Commission to continue to fund these. The, the final position was uh, the British would not object to me making the, um, the, the submission, but they wouldn't overtly support it, but they would sotte voce uh, support it, because they couldn't politically accept the notion that they were actually advocating for an increase of spending anywhere that was settled policy. So I think we have to be brave. We have to set out a vision for Europe now, and really the weight of Brexit for the last three years has just... I think, ground us down. And in a way, we should break free of that now and envisage what Europe will be like. And hopefully, funded and dynamic in a way that a future British government and a future British electorate will want to rejoin. Hello, good morning. My name is Suzanne Keating. I'm the CEO of DOCUS, the uh, platform of international NGOs. Um, I know for many of us, kind of yesterday is probably kind of uh, the day of the week around Brexit, but um, this week was also the 74th anniversary of Auschwitz, the liberation of Auschwitz. And so it reminded us of the very ideals of the European Union, and it's very much around that, that uh, it's, its role around global peace um, and, and conflict. So I'm interested to hear what your perspective is around the European Union's approach right now on migration and refugees? Should Ireland be playing a stronger, uh, a more progressive role? And, and kind of more broadly around external action. As so much of the conversation at the European Union at the moment is about Europe, not about its role in the, in the bigger world, if you like, uh, particularly around poverty reduction and global peace. So again, interested to hear what, what will you be fighting for, what would be calling for uh, in terms of Europe's direction? Thank you. Yeah, there's a number of strands to your question, obviously. Um, the migration question is a standalone 
moral um, question that weighs on us all. And, uh, you, you know, we've made lots of speeches in the Dáil in relation to it, almost saying we can be moral because it doesn't affect us very much and something should be done. Um, less in embracing the solution ourselves. Um, Labour has always advocated uh, for taking uh, our responsi responsibilities seriously. Um, we, for example, um, opposed the change of the constitution some years ago uh, that denied Irish citizenship to people born here in certain circumstances. Uh, that was a very minority position, and I think something like 80% of the population voted for it. Um, but I think we need to be clear in what we want to do. And again, that dilemma, uh, as I said, my, my most immediate interactions with Europe, with European leaders, is at the European uh, PEZ leaders' meetings. And there is a, a dichotomy there, too. If you hear um, people like uh, Prime Minister Costa uh, or Sanchez of, of Spain, they're very strong and passionate advocates for integration and acceptance. But even some of the Nordics now, um, seared by their own political uh, experience, are more reluctant to do that. I think, again, it's an area where we have to set out an agreed moral um, position. One, that we can bring our people with us. Um, we have been lucky in this polity, in our politics here, by and large, that we haven't had um, a, a huge contamination of racist rhetoric or populism. Um, some would argue that that has begun to be undermined in recent times. Um, but we'll see how that pans out. Um, uh, I can test it close to home. That's all I'll say. Question from the back. Thank you, uh, Deputy Hyland, and thanks again to the IIEA for uh, hosting these very important series of discussions uh, with party leaders. My name is Selena Donnelly, and I work uh, with Chokra. I was glad to hear you give priority to the urgent need for action on climate and biodiversity crisis that we're facing globally. Uh, my question is, um, if uh, taking part in the next government, um, will you commit to push that Ireland immediately joins the group of EU member states that are calling for an increase in the EU's 2030 climate targets to at least 55%, aiming for 65% reductions in line with the latest findings of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, and then also work to deliver an 8% a year annual reduction in emissions in the lifetime of the next government? Thank you. Um, we're very good in this country of setting targets and publishing policy platforms, uh, our normal difficulty is actually achieving them. Um, we've set out within the Oireachtas uh, to try and overcome that in a structured way, and that's why we had an all-party plan. Uh, Sean Sherlock worked for us in relation to that. We brought in the experts um, to see what we could actually achieve with, with great ambition and determination. Uh, and we've embraced that as our party political strategy. It, it is very ambitious. It is to have um, greenhouse gas emissions by 2030. Um, that's going to be extraordinarily difficult to bring it from 60, to, uh, 60 million tonnes to uh, 30 million tonnes over that period. It has to go across all sectors of the, uh, of the economy um, with hard questions uh, to be answered. But like, like all um, public platforms in this country, when we had the all-party discussions, with experts um, giving um, very clear testimony of what needed to be done. Everybody signed up to it, except at the very end when there was some hard policy choice that just might be unpopular, and people started resiling from that then. Um, if we believe, as I do, and my party does, that climate change is a quintessential challenge to humanity and biodiversity on the planet, then we must step up to the plate, and that means changing fundamentally the way we do things. But the final sentence I'll say on this is, I think actually um, labor movements and labor parties are uniquely equipped to actually address those, because most of the, the elements in terms of the changes we have to make are related to work and to the labor movement, in transport, in work itself, in energy generation, in agriculture, uh, and we need to make those fundamental changes in a just way. So that's why, for example, we support the carbon tax, the increase in the carbon tax that's set out in the plan, and also uh, we support the ring-fencing of that for a just transition. Because we, I have gone to communities in the Midlands who are going to lose the traditional work there, but we have to set out a different version 
of how they can be employed in re-wetting the bogs, recreating biodiversity, in recreating soft uh, green energy uh, through, through wind and so on, and in a massive program of retrofit. But that, but that will be a colossal investment. So we can't pretend that we can do that without having the taxes. Thank you very much. Stéphane Cruz, our French ambassador. I have two questions, in fact. One, one is on uh, uh, corporate taxation. Do you think it's at the right level? Do you think the OECD, uh, should there not be uh, an agreement at OECD, it, it will go back to the European Union uh, discussions and what would, would be your position in that respect? And the second question is more general. It's regarding the future conference on the future of Europe, which might be launched as early as the 9th of May, where there will be discussions about where we want the EU to, to go at, uh, uh, w among all the citizens. What would be your proposals for that uh, conference on the future of Europe? Um, two very broad-ranging questions. In terms of corporation tax, um, our position is very clear. Um, we support the existing 12.5% corporation tax that exists in Ireland, but we want it to be an effective rate of corporation tax, uh, which it isn't for many uh, corporations. And we want a permanent commission on taxation to ensure that uh, as tax avoidance measures are, are, are um, uh, discovered that we, we close them. Um, I worked uh, in my time in government um, with the OECD in relation to the base erosion and profit shifting process, the BEPS process. Um, I'm very strongly of the view that you can't um, unilaterally um, alter the corporation tax because corporations are, are global. Um, Intellectual property is extraordinarily global, and it can cite itself wherever it, it suits. So we need to have an international agreed uh, structure for it. Uh, and I think great progress has been made. We, in, in government, ended some of the anomalies that had been created here, including the double Irish. Um, and we want to have a transparent and fair taxation system. Um, when, when you drill down and you talk to any of the colleagues, uh, often in countries, including, I have to say, in your own in France, what you see is not what you necessarily get when you look at the... Um, the, the actual treatment of corporations on a regional basis, hidden subsidies and, and, and so on. So we, do, we need to have complete transparency in relation to taxation and we need to ensure from a moral perspective that corporations pay their fair share. And in Ireland that is an effective tax rate uh, of 12.5% and hopefully that we can have international norms established that are enforceable. We've, we've begun the process by at least having transparency in, about, in what they're paying uh, and we, Ireland has signed up to that. In terms of the future of Europe, um, I, I hope I've set out a vision of what I see um, Ireland's perspective on that. Uh, I think I'd love to see uh, a, a, a model of a, of a social Europe uh, where the principles of, of European solidarity, uh, of equality, are, are, are embedded. There are real challenges to that. And I suppose one of the dilemmas of the last couple of years when we de had debates in the Dáil is the overarching challenge of Brexit has diverted our view from shaping um, what we want for, for Europe. I know Helen McEntee has done a, a fair deal of work on that and we've had some debates on it, uh, but uh, obviously my vision that we would work within the uh, socialist group uh, is to have a, a social Europe uh, where people have aspirations to equality, mobility, uh, and fulfilling their own potential, that you have quality public services like health and education free at the point of delivery, uh, and that we have um, fair taxation that affects everybody across the union. Question in the back, uh, <coughs> Thanks very much, Chair. Uh, Blair Horne, member of the Institute. Uh, thanks very much, Brendan, for your uh, presentation, and I would absolutely agree with your viewpoint that uh, now we have to move closer to the European social market model. Uh, I hope I'm wrong but I think it may still take us time to wean ourselves away from the Anglo-Saxon model. So, and as we do, I'm not convinced that the idea of social Europe, important though it is in terms of citizens' uh, attachment to Europe, I'm not so sure that in itself is enough uh, to secure the future of the European Union in this sense. I'm not worried about Brexit undermining the EU. Since the Schuman Declaration, the UK has always had a problem with pooling sovereignty. I'm more worried about the likes of Salvini and Marine Le Pen and what impact that can have in the future. And um, I feel that the concept of European identity uh, is a very important in terms of, not to replace national identity, but to sit alongside it. Things like um, you know, EU citizens in Ireland being able to have 
similar voting rights like we have on our bilateral basis with the UK and issues like that, that that's important in the future in terms of uh, a greater sense of European identity. And I'm just wondering if your, your view on that, not to replace national identity, but to sit alongside it. Um. I, I, I'm not as sanguine in, in my view in, in relation to our own future. I think this actual election is a very important first step in determining which direction we take. Uh, I don't think it's necessarily the fact that we're going to uh, embrace Europe. Uh, I think that the policy platform, certainly of Fianna Fáil and Fine Gael, and to a great extent Sinn Féin too, uh, is playing to the, the, the old notion that we can um, have low taxes and yet manage to have decent public services. Uh, and it's a con job in my judgment. I've tried to explain that to people. Uh, having tried to mine the money for five years, I have some experience of, of, of you know, that you can only spend each euro once. Uh, you can promise it twice, but you can only spend it once. And I think that um, we, we need to have some reality about that. So if that is going to be the platform we present into the future, um, we're going to have difficulties. And I, I think that... Uh, we need to argue and fight for that, fr from my perspective. Um, I agree with your, your, your concerns about growing nationalism um, and growing populism in, in Europe. Um, it's beginning to manifest itself in very, very narrow slivers here, um, but it hasn't gained any popular traction. But it is a real, a real threat. But the way to overcome that is, you know, it, it, it is the, the, the disease is the same as brought on Brexit in, in the north of England. I canvassed against Brexit. Uh, in Lancashire and in working uh, class areas, where there was massive Labour votes for Labour at that stage, for Labour MPs, but overwhelming votes for exit because this was the, the, the devil incarnate, that decisions would be made in Brussels. Um, and the same with Trump, you know, the, the, the Rust Belt heartlands of, of uh, Demo the Democratic Party. Um, we need to have a different vision for them. Uh, to wean them against, uh, wean them off that, this notion of um, populism being the answer, because it clearly isn't. Uh, but that means real sense of solidarity, real investment, real regionalisation. We need to start here in our country as well, uh, so that we don't uh, suck everything into Dublin, uh, that we do have proper regional policies um, that are actually um, properly uh, invested in. So I think we can create an exciting vision of an alternative Europe that people will rally to. Uh, against the tiredness of, of feeling neglected that has happened over the last while. And can I say, maybe very partisanly, um, the dominance of the Conservative parties in Europe over the last 10 years has weakened the vision of dynamic future for Europe. Uh, if, you, if you look back to the years when uh, socialists were in charge, they were strident in their vision of an, inter of a, an integrated, uh, prosperous, free Europe uh, that has died to death to some degree, and we need to re revive that. Uno Dwar, member of the Institute. Uh, uh, thank you indeed for setting out your clear vision of Ireland's, uh, a vision for Ireland's future in Europe, and indeed for Europe's future direction. Uh, following a little bit on Blair's question, um, and I've asked the same question to the Taoiseach, or a similar question, as earlier today. Uh, how do you propose to ensure that these visions and these, this progress is underpinned by a proper communication from, of Europe to its peoples, not just at the Irish level, but also throughout Europe? And indeed, how could you, we possibly get their necessary support for an increase in the budget if it is not properly communicated to them and indeed they're not connected in some way with it. Thank you. I think Udi, you're asking an extremely um, profound question and I don't have an answer for it. Um, we, we, we spend a lot of our time scratching our head how to communicate the doll to, 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 um, to populations. Um, I mean, the, the, the RTE regards it as something you can put on at 10 past midnight. Um, Pat Rabbit described it as um, for alcoholics and insomniacs. Um, <laughs> Connecting now, I, I know um, I'm, I, I'm, I'm not a politician of the social media age, uh, but even two years ago when I used to do um, videos, 30 seconds, I was told I had to give my message in 30 seconds. Now I'm told if I don't give it in eight seconds, uh, I've, I've lost it. Um, so it's very hard to communicate a, a, on that basis. Um, but uh, we do need to. Um, I think people are interested in politics in Ireland. 
They're interested in, but it has to be relevant to themselves. And there is a distancing. Uh, and it, I, I don't know how, we haven't constructed it yet, but we do need, I know after some referenda we had uh, great thoughts. For example, we, at least now we, we have debates pre-council um, in the Dáil and we post-council in the Dáil. Who reads it? Who listens to it? I don't know. Um, I think we just need to do an awful lot more thinking. And unfortunately, I just don't have an answer to that question because everybody is focused on, on so many different things. Um, I think if we give people a sense of Europe that is positive by delivering for them, then they might be interested in the institutions and making it more democratic. Okay. So perhaps I just have one final sure. question. Sure. Uh, and just bring us back to the, um, our nearest neighbour, uh, yep. uh, the UK. I was just reading a tweet from somebody, a former colleague of mine, that said, morning that ever since the Anglo-Normans arrived here 850 years ago, Ireland and Britain have moved in step um, for good or ill. Even when independent, we joined the EU together. Today we're going our separate ways. By any measure, today is an historic day. Uh, the great Brexit experiment has begun. I suppose it's the, um, you know, we have moved obviously in lockstep with them within the European Union as well. How are we going to fill this gap in the relationship now because we're not going to be at the table with them in Brussels? Yeah. We have obviously got the structure of the Good Friday Agreement, but what else do we need to do to kind of uh, ensure that the relationship is is protected and built? A really, really important question. Um, I think my crowd came over with the Anglo-Normans because uh, they came to Wexford first, as you know, landed in Bag and Bun. Uh, the Howlands were part of um, Strongbow's gang uh, and, um, and didn't move very much beyond Wexford. They obviously uh, decided that the sea journey was enough and uh, most of the Howlands are still there. Um, but in terms of, we need to have a different relationship with Britain. Um, we've had now the opportunity um, of often monthly meetings with ministers, um, uh, bilaterally after European Council meetings, um, very regular uh, meetings. We still will have, obviously, the Good Friday institution, thankfully back in uh, reinstituted now, so we'll have a north-south dialogue and we'll have Council of the Isle dialogues. Uh, but we do need to have, I, I'd love to see a much more structured, uh, like the Nordic countries cooperate, in a, in a much more structured way between Britain and Ireland, uh, so to have regular I I interaction. Um, and that's the next phase of, of our discussion, how we, how we structure that. Uh, we could learn, I think, from our Nordic um, country colleagues uh, to, to have proper dialogue on, on everything we do together. Um, I think the, 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 the model we have for the North-South ministerials where ministers meet uh, every six months and where the full cabinet meets annually is not a bad model for, for, for Britain and Ireland as well. Uh, uh, that's the sort of thing. We do in, in, interact, obviously, um, on a, a parliamentary basis um, and with the, um, with the regional parliaments in the United Kingdom as well. Uh, and I think even more social and cultural interaction is, is an important part of that too. Okay. Well, we're going to draw uh, this event, this third in our um, leader series, to a, a, a close. I want to just thank everybody for being here. I want to thank uh, Brendan Howland in particular for being my locational. So please.